Um, I know you're aware of the current plans to develop the ridges into an even finer and farther reaching educational and natural history institution than it already is. And it's already pretty great. Um, the ridges is celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. And this is one of the ways that we're helping them celebrate. And I'm hoping that we can find other ways to partner up in the future. As Steve once said, they're interested in the natural history, and we're interested in the cultural history, and those things, you know, mesh together frequently. Um, I'd like to introduce Steve Leonard. He is the executive director of the Ridges Sanctuary. He will relate the history of the Ridges, and I'm sure with many wonderful anecdotes and images, and uh, I trust will give an overview of the future plans. I keep reading wonderful things in the paper, incredible grants that have been received, uh, and believe me, I know what it's like to write those things and the thrill that comes when you find that you are actually the one that's getting it. So, uh, Steve? Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, having me tonight. And uh, I know I briefly talked to Chrissy about this too. I think one partnership between the Bailey's Harbor uh, Historic Society and the Ridges itself is in the future as we look for towards our Thursday evening programs and these uh, other evening programs is to really create a, a collaborative marketing program because it is a nice balance between the, the natural history and the cultural history of, of Bailey's Harbor. Uh, I've been here six years, and as I've talked to people, that's what makes Bailey's Harbor unique than any other community up here, is how a community is so immersed in the natural environment. You can sit outside any of the restaurants and see the lake, see bald eagles fly overhead. You can walk the trails at the ridges. You got Kangaroo Lake. Um, it's an incredible uh, small town community that can really act as a model for a lot of others and how you coexist with the environment but sustain your, your economy uh, as you move forward. It is our 75th anniversary. We've had numerous events and um, um, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I'm going to walk through some of the history and integrate our, our vision into uh, some of this. Uh, walk you through the range lights and what we've discovered on that, our founders themselves, um, uh, some of the history and formation of the ridges, and then talk through uh, kind of like a year in review where we're at and where we want to go. Um, a lot of this is really informal. Uh, a lot of this is still uh, being developed, and these stories are coming from the community in many, many different ways, especially from our founders. On, uh, uh, July 28th, we have our, had our 75th anniversary event here, and we had a lot of the relatives of uh, some of our founders uh, come up from that weekend, all the way from uh, North Carolina, uh, uh, Tennessee, and other places to help celebrate that. And so we've started to compile a lot of these stories. Who were these founders? And we're still asking all those relatives or anybody that might have grown up with the Ridges and the people that founded the organization. It all started with the range lights. Um, they were built in 1869 on their original 40 acres. Um, part of our, our vision, too, is to open up these range lights, and we're starting to collect a lot of the information and some of these older uh, pictures. Um, quite open, quite different than they look uh, nowadays. Um, and a lot of the, the colors and everything else, we're trying to research on what colors were a lot of these uh, range lights can actually see a curtain up in the uh, lower range light there. They put that curtain down there because the sun would beat on, that, um, on the lens and actually start a fire in a lot of these uh, uh, range lights. So they always had a curtain or something to cover up the lens during the day. 
As we piece together this story, uh, we're trying to create a timeline and really understand how these range lights were used in the community because they were a community destination point. As we learned from uh, many of the uh, stories, it was a place where the, the um, range light keepers had a lot of different events. And so as we start to tell this story, it all started in 1868 when the uh, first $6,000 $6, were awarded or appropriated to construct the two range lights that were finished in 1869. Um, the stories are starting to come out uh, from on, oh, different books, stories, and, uh, and uh, information that we've tried to collect. We are still missing the keeper's log. Uh, we're trying to find that through the National Archives that might help tell some more of the stories. But some of these pictures are starting to come out in different avenues. 1848, the keeper's uniforms were introduced uh, by the dolly, and it actually delivers it. So in our interpretation, we're not only going to tell the story of the lighthouse keepers, but some of the interactions between Bailey's Harbor itself and the uh, range light keepers. These are some of the improvements that uh, Larson made. He was a range light keeper in the early uh, in the late 1800s, uh, split rail fence and uh, actually had a lot of uh, livestock and everything else up, in, up around the range light itself. What's also amazing is how open Bailey's Harbor was back then uh, with the logging and everything else and some of the old pictures of Bailey's Harbor. Wasn't a lot of trees around, that's for sure. In 1930s, that's where it was uh, turned over to the Emanuel Lutheran Church. And I've heard plenty of stories of um, uh, people growing up and having a Bible study down in the basement of the uh, upper range light. And I don't know if you've ever been down in the uh, basement of that upper range light, but it's quite, quite a place. But from 30 to uh, 56, it was a parsonage. And so it was a real connection again to the community. And a lot of those stories are coming out. Um, 56 to 1965, there was, um, we heard story of a family renting the place, but we haven't really understood all those connections yet and trying to uncover that story. In 1965 then, that's when um, uh, the lease was turned over to the Ridges Sanctuary and the Ridges hired its first full-time natural, or part-time naturalist, or first employee, Roy Lucas, and part of that uh, deal was that then he would uh, live in the upper range light. And then in 1969, the lenses were removed. And uh, from there, it's been uh, used as the Ridges uh, office. And um, uh, our goal then is to start to convert that over and into telling the story. This timeline is still in the works. And we're asking the community to come forward with any of their stories or anything else that to help uh, uh, piece that story together of the upper range lights. In 1935, a gentleman named by Albert Fuller actually did the plant, first plant survey of um, the ridges up around the upper range light. With the upper range light, the, it was the, the building was owned by the Coast Guard and the 40 acres surrounding it. In 1935, when it was decommissioned or turned over to the Emanuel Lutheran Church, uh, they also turned over the 40 acres to the Door County Parks Commission. And the Parks uh, Commission just didn't know what to do with the property. So for two years, there was a lot of talk of uh, converting the park or the 40 acres over into a campground. Well, Albert Fuller started the third survey in 1935 and started to realize how unique the property was. He discovered 25 out of the 40 native orchids in the uh, uh, state of Wisconsin right there in the 40 acres, plus a diversity of other plants. This is the original 40 acres. Kind of give you a, an idea of the location. Yep, 
that green area right there. So it kind of gives you a, a perspective of what we're looking at. The upper and the lower range site, and then the 40 acres surrounding it with the uh, uh, Ridges County Park uh, right along the beach there. Yeah, and if anybody has any questions that I go through this, feel free to stop me or raise your hand as I talk through it. We're looking for a picture of the Women's Club of 1937. We have one of 1934 because it was the Women's Club. The president was Anna McCardell, vice president was Olivia Traven. Albert Fuller went to the Women's Club and talked about the ridges and its importance. And uh, they're the ones that hosted the first meeting in the spring of 1937. And Albert Fuller had this real mission. He used the research to understand what's out there, but then he really wanted to start a grassroots movement in communities to understand what's in their own backyard and help protect it. So he, he was on a real education. Turn down the volume a little bit. He was on a, a real education mission to work with the community and develop that understanding of what was out there. And he started with the Women's Club. I just don't know if there's that picture out there of the 1937 Women's Club, but that's the kind of information we're trying to pull into this whole story. This was a picture taken out at Maxwell and Bray's um, in the original building. Um, but then it started this whole movement of understanding how important that original 40 acres was. And it started a, a real grassroots movement with um, a lot of our founders. And they, they realized that not only do they need to preserve the, uh, the 40 acres, but they need to look at beyond that 40 acres, going beyond um, their wildest dreams. So through an education movement, they uh, convinced the Parks Commission to turn over the 40 acres to the Ridges Sanctuary. And it started the uh, uh, Articles of Incorporation. They had really ambitious goals. They wanted to acquire, uh, by gift purchase or otherwise, part of the real estate in the area known as uh, town of Bailey's Harbor, uh, known as the, the Ridges or the Bog. What I've heard is just called the Swamp, you know, north of town. Um, but they really wanted, realized they had to go beyond that 40 acres. They also had this ambition of buying land throughout the state. Um, Albert Fuller had this dream of protect, protecting botanical uh, monuments. And this came from his real love of um, flora, and in particular, orchids. In 1933, I have one of the copies over there, he um, published a, a book, Orchids of Wisconsin. He was the curator of botany down at the Milwaukee Public Museum. And he just had this real passion for, from, for orchids. And it came from his childhood, in which uh, his mom would send his, him and his sister out to find the queen um, of the forest. And the queen of the forest was the uh, showy lady slipper. And he describes this experience of always seeking out that showy lady slipper as a child, and it just uh, turned into a real passion for him. And so when he uh, uh, came up here to the ridges, it, it sparked that passion beyond the 40 acres, not only pre preserve the ridges, but to really um, develop an educational movement and this preservation throughout the state of Wisconsin to protect these botanical monuments. But they also realized just buying land was not the only or the sole answer in protecting these properties. He really needed to develop a research program for that understanding and education for awareness. So this group formed the Ridges Sanctuary. Frank Goldenberg was our first board president. He was a developer in town, of all things. He built uh, my house. Uh, uh, I live in the Traven house. He built numerous houses. But he also understood the importance of protecting land, a place like the Ridges Sanctuary. As uh, Lee Traven uh, described Frank Goldenberg, he had this uh, uh, a calming effect to take these strong personalities and keep them focused and keep that board uh, working in the right direction. Jens Jensen, the famous landscape architect from Chicago who also started declaring, uh, jumped right on board too with Albert Fuller. Uh, he wrote numerous articles for many, many years uh, to develop that awareness of the importance of the ridges. 
Martha Fulkerson uh, worked at the clearing too. Uh, we don't know as much uh, about her as we do uh, Jens Jensen, but uh, a real strong advocate for protecting uh, natural, natural areas in Door County. Olivia Traven, the librarian, uh, very active in many, many uh, issues in Door County over the years. Uh, but uh, the story goes, uh, uh, she was actually our first naturalist. That before there was any uh, nature center out there or trails, people would knock on her door. She'd get on her coat, uh, walking stick or whatever, and take people out and uh, develop that awareness of um, the ridges and the importance of the native flora and fauna. Uh, I've talked to other uh, students that also grew up in, in Bailey's Harbor. Mondays she would close down the library at 3 o'clock because she believed that it was an incredible classroom and she would take the kids over there uh, to the ridges. And then there was Emma Tuft. Just like the uh, picture that's on the mural, uh, Emma ran the inn out at uh, uh, Tuft Point and had a real uh, ability to make this uh, connection to the outdoors. Would uh, pile kids into our station wagon and make sure that they were always out there at Tuff Point or walking the ridges, uh, making that natural connection. Anna McCardle, uh, native uh, Jacksonport, uh, and I just got some of the stories from Chris, uh, understanding who she was. Uh, another real strong uh, personality, president of the Women's Club that helped spearhead this whole uh, project, uh, preserving the Ridges Sanctuary. The Seeker family, uh, we had their relatives up on July 28th. They still own the cabin over on Kangaroo Lake where the, where the Articles of Incorporation were signed. Mrs. Seeker was on the board with uh, George. Bill Seeker actually drafted the Articles of Incorporation. George and Bill were in their early 20s, mid 20s, uh, both attorneys that helped facilitate not only the articles and incorporations, but many land transactions uh, throughout uh, the Ridges history and, and the Nature Conservancy. The family was talking about the two boys in the sense that one loved, and I can't remember who, which, which one liked uh, what, but one loved moths and butterflies, and one worked with the Milwaukee Public Museum, and uh, there's over 16,000 specimens uh, collected down at the museum uh, dedicated to one of the Seeker boys. The other one loved snakes, and would collect live snakes in mason jars and had them all over the cabin all of the time. So um, two different um, interests, but again, with their abilities and uh, backgrounds, really helped form the organization. Uh, Arthur Guckenauer uh, came, was, um, lived down in northern Illinois, had a second home up here, was a, a real strong businessman and brought that to the table. He helped fund the first uh, gift. Uh, there was an essay contest before the Ridges was formed in the schools, and it was a $30 gift, and that was a lot of money back in the Great Depression in 1937 uh, to the student who uh, won the essay. Um, but he brought his business talent to it, to the table. John Motter, we don't have any pictures, we don't have any relatives, we're still trying to uh, uncover his story. We know that he came up from northern Illinois, talking to Lee Traven, uh, he had a, the Motter family had a store in Ephraim, we've talked to the Ephraim Historic Society, we haven't really uncovered a lot of his story yet. But he was in marketing and also helped write a lot uh, of information for the Ridges. These people got together in, in many, many different, uh, from many different backgrounds, but worked together on a common ca cause to form the Ridges Sanctuary back in 1937. It was a real ambitious goal. Uh, it was still at the tail end of uh, the Great Depression. They just knew it was the right thing to do. They knew they needed more land and they started out on this venture, and 75 years later, we're sitting at 1,600 acres. Um, a lot of the land was uh, actually donated in the first couple years. The first summer, they had a speaker series, uh, not only in Bailey's Harbor, but throughout uh, uh, northern Dora County. Uh, trails were mapped out. Uh, they brought in the WPA uh, program and individuals to start the trail system. And they always incorporated the schools in, into um, a connection with the ridges through Olivia and Emma. By 1946, 
They had 520 acres. They were really kind of struggling through it. But when you start to look at these annual reports, um, 120 acres back there in 1946 was $742. Uh, it was a real obstacle for them, but they just kept on adding one piece after another. Um, focused in on Bailey's Harbor. And I think that's where you got to go back to that mission, is that this vision of protect, protecting botanical monuments was an incredible vision, but they realized it was going to be just too much beyond Bailey's Harbor. So that's where the story of Albert Fuller comes in. And I don't know how many have heard the story of Albert Fuller. It's a pretty phenomenal story. Uh, it's kind of one of the unsung heroes of, of Wisconsin conservation. Uh, he was the curator of botany at the Milwaukee Public Museum. Uh, he launched this, uh, the Ridges Sanctuary, but took this vision and sold it throughout the state. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the gentleman next to him, Chester Cook. And we, um, in this picture, it was taken in 1937 or 39. Uh, Chester Cook was uh, 16 years old. That was when he met Albert Fuller. Albert Fuller down in Milwaukee got really engaged in a lot of uh, youth programs, the Scouts, uh, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs, and, and got the, the kids engaged not only through school programs but also in the museum. He needed someone, a chauffeur, to drive him up to Door County. He had a eye disease, he couldn't get a driver's license. Uh, he needed someone to carry his camera around and everything else. As Chester told me, uh, he was living on the streets of Milwaukee and Albert Fuller gave him this chance. He gave him a possibility uh, or this opportunity and he grabbed it. At the age of 16, he started to drive Albert Fuller up here, talked uh, about his experiences not only here, but then uh, as he worked with Albert Fuller, they uh, started this mission uh, to collect plant specimens throughout the state of Wisconsin, part of a, a WPA program. <laughs> Albert Fuller took this idea in 1938 of uh, trying to protect these botanical monuments, worked with uh, others from the Milwaukee Public Museum, University of uh, Wisconsin, like with Elder Leopold. And the idea was to convince local communities on the importance of preserving these areas but also using it for tourism, building that local economy. And he had this vision back in 1938 when the tourism season was only second to the, uh, the dairy industry. He realized that if the local community started a grassroots system, not only could they preserve it, but they could educate everybody about the importance of uh, the flora and fauna in their own community. This list is 60 years of information where we've uh, been working with the Milwaukee Public Museum on about Albert Fuller and his importance of Wisconsin conservation history. 1926, he uh, uh, publishes our Wisconsin orchids and their preservation. 1937, he started on the ridges in this venture with uh, the local community. 1945, he forms the first state natural areas committee um, and that was the beginning of the whole state natural areas program. They were given $5,000 a year to start to uh, purchase land throughout the state. It was this vision that we've learned from the state natural areas program that started at the ridges. Albert Fuller took that vision and sold it and started the uh, state natural areas committee. In 1950, uh, the Ecologist Union reorganizes as the Nature Conservancy and Fuller is chairman of the Committee for Preservation and Natural condition, uh, uh, Conditions. He starts to help buy purchase land throughout the United States. 1951, um, uh, the first uh, organization turns into the State Board for the Preservation of Scientific Areas and that's when uh, you started seeing the designation of state natural areas. This whole story has grown into uh, a vision that's protected over 350,000 acres and is uh, now funded by this uh, uh, Knowles Stewardship Grant and the purchase of land throughout the state of Wisconsin. It was a vision that started right here in Bailey's Harbor and because of Albert Fuller, it continued on beyond Bailey's Harbor and influenced the whole state and Wisconsin conservation history. Well, what makes the ridges so important? I kind of highlighted a lot of the, the cultural history. We're still trying to piece that story together. 
Uh, we need your help to tell those stories. And it's also the story about the ridges itself. These air photos show the 30 ridges and swales. It's the old lake levels of Lake Michigan. Uh, estimates are that first ridge is about 14 to 1500 years old. And over time, that lake has uh, lowered in, in level, and it seems like it's continuing to lower. Um, and you can kind of see the ridges out in the sandy area, and that's what uh, makes Bailey's Harbor Beach uh, so nice for kids and families. But it's that formation over time. Each ridge would form with the, the wave action, create a, a beach or a dune. The water would lower, come back up again, form another ridge, and depending on the hydrology and the geology, uh, would form a swale in between. The upwelling from the Lake Michigan, it's that cool, moist air coming off the lake, also impacts the vegetation on site. It creates what we um, call a boreal effect, where up in upper uh, Wisconsin and into Canada, you have uh, a forest that are dominated by white spruce, balsam fir, uh, often mixed with uh, birch, cedar, and white pine. That upwelling has created such a diversity with the geology and the hydrology there that has created a, a huge diversity in the ridges sanctuary itself. In those 30 ridges and, and swales, we have 15 uh, different plant communities. So as you walk from one bridge to the next, you're walking from one plant community to the, to the other. Overall, from our 1983 uh, plant survey, we have 40, 475 uh, vast year plants, or diversity of plants. It's because of that, that setting in between um, uh, the land in Lake Michigan and that upwelling and the climate has created a, an incredible um, site for diversity of flora and fauna. That vision of protecting 40 acres going beyond the orchids uh, has uh, uh, preserved uh, the most biologically diverse landscape or town or most diverse, uh, most diverse landscape uh, in any township in Wisconsin. What we are known for are the orchids. Uh, we've struggled with some species like the showy lady slipper. We've lost uh, numerous populations over the years. We're trying to understand why that loss uh, has occurred. Some of it's shading. Uh, main re reason is the deer population. But that's again where we're going to start to refocus ourselves into uh, some of the research. But when you start to think about the ridges, it's all this diversity. It's just not the orchids anymore. It's the diversity of what we're trying to protect. And our vision is looking at the landscape more than individual species. Because of all that diversity, we've been uh, recognized as a, as a national natural landmark, uh, the most biologically uh, diverse uh, landscape in Wisconsin, an important bird area uh, because of that diversity, not only at the ridges, but all along the coast of uh, Door County along the lakeshore. Uh, it's a wetland gem. And again, starting back in 1937, we're Wisconsin's first member-based uh, nature preserve. That's a lot of the history, some of the cultural history. And what I want to do is just kind of talk about where we're at now. It started with this vision of these individual orchids, and we will always get back to those orchids. But we have to think of more holistic uh, approach to managing the ridges. Um, getting back to the, the, to the orchids, we did a, a Ram's Head orchid study. In fact, uh, Roy Lucas um, started one in the late 80s. We followed up on that, and what we've learned is basically we don't know much about these species. Uh, we did population counts, and the population counts are, are the same, but the species have moved. Where Roy set up his plots back in the late 80s, they've actually moved further back into the ridges and swales. And so now the next uh, step is to try to understand why. This year, we were funded a Fish and Wildlife grant to really look at the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. It's been a focus for many years up now, and, um, and the push for a lot of the land acquisitions to protect the species. 
not only where it's living in its habitat, but the whole groundwater recharge area. We're doing a, a strong, excuse me, strong outreach program, working with landowners to understand what people uh, can do in a positive way, working side by side with them, not to impact the groundwater. The Heinz Emerald is kind of a, a canary for us for water quality, a huge issue in Door County. And it's a matter of how do we coexist with these environments, not only protecting the Heinz, but protecting our own water quality. We constantly work on invasive species up here. Again, we uh, received another uh, grant from Fish and Wildlife to handle some of the species. It's the biggest threat, uh, one of the biggest threats to maintaining this diversity, the Phragmites, reed canary grass, and the, the list goes on. Um, we're working on our perimeters and working with landowners to control invasives as we look forward uh, to hopefully uh, protect this diversity in many years uh, to come. We do numerous education programs. Uh, we have summer camps, family programs. We do student uh, school programs. We bring them onto site. The one thing that we started to look at again is to revisit this whole Chester Cook, Albert Fuller story. We, through the Rotary program, we brought up uh, Milwaukee students and doing a student exchange program. I have four kids uh, myself at uh, Gibraltar. And the one thing that they're struggling with is what are their next steps? What are those other options out there after high school? Uh, with Rotary, what we're doing is uh, bringing students from an urban setting up here and exposing them to our strength, our natural history uh, and experiences. They spent um, two nights, yeah, Wednesday, Thursday, yeah, two nights over at the Girl Scout camp. They spent the morning, came up Wednesday night, spent the uh, night at the Girl Scout camp, spent the morning at the Ridges Sanctuary, went over to Peninsula State Park and for the afternoon, had a pizza party out here at the Bailey's Harbor Town Hall, um, camped out one more night, and then got on the bus and, and left. It was just the beginning of this exchange program. Our ultimate goal then is to take students up here down to Milwaukee and expose them to their strengths in our urban setting. How do they coexist with uh, uh, Lake Michigan and the natural environment, but the rich cultural history down there in, in Milwaukee. The lower range lights has been uh, in the news quite a bit too. And uh, Marge and Sarah, two of the founder uh, uh, donors, have come forward and we finally finished that campaign that will start the renovations on this lower range light. Uh, being on the National Registry triggers all these um, uh, protocols that we have to go through to make sure these buildings sustain themselves. The biggest problem that we were running in with the lower range light is the humidity problem inside. It was collecting inside and rotting from the inside out, plus a lot of the snow build up on the outside uh, right along Ridges Road. So this fall, uh, thank goodness to all the people that contributed it, we're, we're going to start the renovations and uh, restore the lower range light. We've worked uh, hard with a lot of community events, and we want to continue to do that. Uh, the bike rider brought in over 700 bike riders, uh, not only here, starting here at Bailey's Harbor, but took them around the uh, northern part of uh, Door County. Uh, we did the Bear Festival. Uh, it was a great success, uh, bringing people in as another fundraiser. Uh, our other event is the Festival of Nature, in which uh, we worked with um, uh, all the other cooperative uh, organizations like uh, the Nature Conservancy, Door County Land Trust, the Clearing, uh, Crossroads, and give people an environmental experience or, or exploration over the weekend of Memorial Day. Uh, it was special this year because Bailey's Harbor became a bird city, uh, a recognition, recognition um, few in towns have uh, throughout uh, Wisconsin, but something that Bailey's Harbor is uh, really proud of and that connection to the natural environment. <laughs> One thing I, um, uh, there's several books and I brought some tonight. There's always been a connection to artists or writers of the ridges. And we did a, um, Reading the Ridges too, went to artists, uh, walked the ridges, got inspiration from the different patterns, designs, and colors out there, and did an art exhibit over at the Link ga Gallery this year. Our volunteers, are, are a phenomenal group that really inspire uh, one another and inspire the small staff that we have. And it's what makes the Ridges 
so important. It started with a volunteer group and will always be main, maintained by a volunteer group if they're running our nature store, uh, our Wednesday crew that helps with all kinds of odds and ends uh, Wednesday morning. Individuals working on uh, citizen monitoring programs or um, education programs or plant surveys. Uh, it's uh, an initiative we're taking where people are learning a, a lot about their connection to the natural environment and applying it to many different ways. I think that's the backbone uh, of the ridges and it will always be is this volunteer core that makes the organization work year after year. Now we get to the vision and I've been talking for 45 minutes or so or something like that and I'll walk through this and then open everything up to questions. Um, there's been a lot of talk about this building and um, I'm going to walk you through kind of the vision and where we're at with it and this connection that we're making with uh, Bailey's Harbor. I think that's the biggest uh, I guess initiative or uh, plus in this whole uh, process is finally this physical link between the ridges and Bailey's Harbor. We can bring people into Bailey's Harbor, they park in the community, then they can experience uh, the ridges by walking up to the Interpretive Center. They can walk down the Ann Clam Park and um, experience everything in between. We're looking at a family discovery trail on our property west of uh, Highway 57. Um, what makes Bailey's Harbor so unique is we're immersed in the natural world with Lake Michigan, the ridges, uh, and the natural community all around Bailey's Harbor. That with its cultural history makes it an incredible experience for any visitor or resident. We started down this process of stewardship, stewardship through research and education again. Uh, working with first the demolition of the building Working with Eric Pyle and Pyle Construction, we've figured out a way to recycle or reuse any kind of building in Dora County. We, working with Eric, he figured out ways that people need, like the, the trusses, um, any material uh, within the building found a home one way or the other. It's a new uh, um, uh, initiative that we can help promote throughout Dora County compared to just uh, taking things to the landfill. We're working on a family discovery trail. When you look at this, the entrance would be off the parking lot uh, just behind the um, fire station. It's a loop system that goes up to County Q and then uh, up from there. We're emphasizing that experience again with children. You know, that story of Albert Fuller of uh, always seeking out um, the queen of the forest, the showy lady slipper. What we want to do is uh, get the kids off the trail again. Give them an experience where they can go out and discover the natural environment on their own pace. Giving that comfort level to parents. Um, this is an area that protects our drainage, but it's not ecologically as sensitive as the heart of the ridges, the original 40 acres, and where those orchids are. That area, you need to stay on the trails. This area, we need the families to get off trails and really explore what it means by uh, being connected to the outdoor, outdoors. There's this screen door concept. We keep on talking about the, the building itself. Um, when you're inside the building, there will be uh, exhibits explaining the ridges and swales themselves. Um, but it will always be a visual connection to the outside. I think that's what's so important. We all grew up in, um, most of us grew up in a setting where you had a cabin or a screen door on the back porch or something like that. That door and my house was always open. There's always that cool breeze going through. You could hear everything from the outside. Uh, we want to continue that concept in our building, not only uh, on the building itself, but throughout Bailey's Harbor. Again, I think that's that, that what makes Bailey's Harbor so unique, is that no matter where you're at, you're always seems to be, uh, there's a connection to the uh, natural world. The vision will also looks at a uh, handicapped accessible boardwalk. It takes them from that uh, concept in the uh, interpretation in the building, talks about the founders a little bit, but tells their story all along this boardwalk. Talks about uh, an, a librarian, an innkeeper, uh, a developer, 
that had this vision and came together uh, with a common goal and mission. It wasn't um, uh, anybody special as much as just everybody working together as a community to make this whole vision work. Uh, along that trail would be a lot of interpretive signs. Steve, where the, uh, be? It's right behind, uh, it's that yellow line. Oh, okay. Yep. So the new interpre interpretive center will have those glass walls. You'll be looking out, of, out at uh, restored uh, ridges and swales. And from that point, you'll be able to enter uh, the ridges on this boardwalk that goes up to, um, I'll talk a little about, about this too before I get into the upper range light. Um, the one opportunity we are looking at this area, uh, it was, um, uh, can't remember. Pruder. The Pruder's uh, farm, I believe, is where the old, um, where, where the bookstore is now. They had a farm, and Lee Traven said they always walked their cows down uh, to the swales, and that was their grazing area and watering hole. Uh, being grazed over, that whole part of the ridges and swales uh, ecologically needs a lot of work. So now we're starting to look at this whole area as a classroom. Again, getting back into research, reintroducing some of these key species as we work with the uh, boardwalk, uh, identifying where to put the boardwalk, not impacting the, uh, the key species, but also giving us an opportunity to open up that area. That boardwalk will lead you up into the upper range light, that existing trail. And there we would open up the upper range light uh, for interpretation. That whole timeline that I talked about at the beginning would be on that first floor, that people would walk around and experience what it was like in the upper range light. Uh, talking about the lighthouse keepers, uh, uh, the building used as a parsonage, the building basically used as a, a community uh, resource. And then they'd be able to walk up into the uh, lantern room. The one thing that we've learned too is that um, the ridges focus has changed many, many times over the years. It will always be about the uh, orchids. It was always uh, about the flora and protecting uh, the land. But there's other obstacles that we've been faced with and challenged with and we will continue uh, to be faced with as we move forward into the next 75 years. One is the, uh, the um, purchasing the sandpiper property. It was the um, the use of kerosene on fish boils, we discovered that the kerosene doesn't actually uh, burn off, but it soaks down into the ground. So we did a whole remediation process uh, with site, on site working with Don Valenti. And I can't compliment Don Valenti enough. He sat down with us and it became a really community problem solving process in which we all sat down and figured out how are we going to address this issue. Uh, working together as a community not only to address the issue on site, but a way that uh, fish boils can continue. Um, five wells were drilled, and we uh, discovered that at the uh, one fish boil site, uh, the kerosene created this plume underneath the soil. It was a really easy solution, though, to uh, resolve this. It was a common, it's a common practice used time and time again for the last 50 plus years. He just, um, working with Don, Don came up with a solution where he put a, a metal drum in the ground with a trough. The kerosene ran down the trough into the metal containment system and he stopped the, the contamination. It was a discovery that uh, none of us expected, uh, but we all sat down together as a community and solved this problem. Since then, White Gold Inn and Beantown Campground has implemented the same thing and we're constantly working with the other fish boil sites to control this contamination to once again protect our, our water quality. It's an issue that the Ridges is starting to realize is that we're going way beyond the original mission of protecting the, um, uh, the uh, orchids, looking at it holistically, protecting our watershed and water quality. Part of the uh, site, design, site design then is Highway 57 and Ridges Road. You start to see the building lined up. Um, the, the contaminated soil was actually rebuilt, one of the ridges. And that whole site, when you walk uh, back in there, you can see how the ridges uh, were and swales were filled in over time. 
We're going to restore those right up to the north side of the building. Uh, we've integrated the whole project in a, as a research project with Lawrence University students. Uh, and then the site design will act, act as a model for um, stormwater management. I think it's really critical in such a sensitive area in uh, Door County uh, to create models that really understand how to protect water quality and quantity. We'll do a phyto remediation process. Uh, what's amazing is that um, oyster mushroom spores and um, bacteria and plants themselves can break down the petroleum products just given time. So that whole ridge again will be a model on how to deal with some of the issues we're faced with uh, today. July 17th and 18th, we started the remediation. You can actually see the contaminated soil is the black soil just below the surface. Kerosene. Yep, the, um, the kerosene collected in that organic layer, it was about uh, two and a half, three feet down, all the way down to bedrock that was about eight to 10 feet down. It was mixed uh, uh, with uh, mulch. Uh, some of the contaminated soil was used for Lawrence University study uh, students to uh, set up their study. The uh, bio pile was created and then working with the um, town of Bailey's Harbor, we sampled the dredging material out of the marina. They had stockpiled it up north. Uh, we did a compacting um, study on it and it come to find out we can use that for fill. So we recycled all that dredging material that's been pulled out of the marina and start to fill in the site. We're looking at different levels in just given time. Uh, we're trying to get these levels down far enough. Uh, we're looking at levels at 100 milligrams per kilogram uh, to close out the site and it'll just uh, take time before that bacteria and plants will um, break down that petroleum pro product. Again, it gets into the story of Albert Fuller and Chester Cook. Um, uh, it's this incredible story of this partnership and this opportunity that they both had that took us down this venture in which we're looking at uh, naming the building then the Cook Albert Fuller Center. Uh, it's a phenomenal story of uh, this opportunity and this vision of uh, stewardship through research and education. It's this partnership with Bailey's Harbor in many, many different ways through events, but this also this uh, a community of learning. From the beginning, everybody wanted to know what they're looking at. If it was plants, birds, whatever, it's always been a sense of, uh, of um, learning. And uh, it's been these opportunities that have started to come forward that we're starting to really look forward to this whole new vision. Um, we received the Scenic Byways Grant, which was a, a phenomenal uh, launch to this whole uh, um, uh, project that will help fund a lot of the exhibits. Uh, we're continuing to look at fundraising and develop this whole vision uh, into the future and also getting everybody's input and uh, stories to help t tell the story as a community. Not only around the founders but uh, through our memories book project that some of you have participated and, and other stories as we develop more exhibits in the future. I'm going to end with uh, this collaborative effort on the mural project itself. Um, I think that mural really shows how the community has always worked together. Uh, you have Emma Tuft, you have the lower range light, you have a lot of the historic uh, buildings itself uh, on this mural. Uh, collaboratively, it helps tell that whole story of Bailey's Harbor itself. And I know Nancy, is Nancy here somewhere? Yeah. Oh, over here, I uh, wanted to mention a, a few words about the mural project itself, and maybe the, the status of it. Well, um, Nancy, would you give me the mic, please? Uh, yes. Back here at the table, I can explain things a little more. We've got brochures about it. Uh, we do want this, like, like the Ridges has been a community project, the mural is a community project, and I welcome all input in all kinds of ways. Um, just one of the features that I think um, 
uh, Leanne mentioned early uh, is that central building. That is not the SRAM building. It is the Brand Brothers store, which stood on the site where Nelson's Hardware Store is currently. And um, it was a building that was not a brick building. It was tin uh, sided uh, with a, a wood base, which I think is quite interesting. Uh, as far as other features in the, in the mural, I can tell you more about that uh, afterward. Okay, thank you. With that, um, I want to thank you for your time tonight. Uh, again, this is really a work in progress, and the more you can bring things forward to help us tell this whole story, we sure would appreciate it. So thank you for your time. Are there any questions or? Steve, what does the grant from the highways cover for the uh, Basically, the indoor exhibits and the uh, boardwalk. Um, it was $554,000, and I think there was like some cents in there or something. But anyways, uh, it's the indoor exhibits and then the, the boardwalk itself, uh, the handicapped accessible boardwalk. Does the ridges have, or will the ridges have, a land management plan? That's a good question. We do have a, a real basic land management plan, but that well, we just had a board meeting at 3 o'clock, 3 to 5 today, talking about that next strategic plan. The, this push was on education and uh, really telling our story. And that was the first five years since I've been here. The next five years is this land management plan. How do we start to look at some of these key species, like the showy lady slipper? If we want to reintroduce them, how are we going to do that and make that work? Uh, we've lost that, that um, our icon of the ridges over the years. How do we start to bring it back? So it, it's the next big push over the next five years. I think that's the biggest concern with all this land out here. How are we going to best manage it, not only for the, the flora and the end of individual species like the, the orchids, but on a, a watershed scale. Everybody's backyard is going to influence someone's water quality somewhere and how do we work with all our neighbors to make it work. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.